On this Thursday night, flooding emergency. Well, this is pretty scary stuff. Thousands forced to flee as a surge of water and ice devastates a northern town. Pretty tragic for the community. I mean, it's obviously a sad day, but it's also frustrating for people that aren't here. Plus, the other communities facing extreme weather damage. Russia's war leads to NATO expansion. There is a real threat here for countries in Europe. Two Nordic nations signal they want into the alliance as the Kremlin threatens retaliation. Wrongly accused of poaching eagle feathers. They treated this like it was a criminal act and it wasn't. The indigenous men seeking an apology over their wrongful arrest. And the Milky Way monster, the never before seen evidence of what lies in the center of our galaxy. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. There is a range of extreme weather across this country, a heat wave in central Canada, and catastrophic floods devastating areas in the prairies and the north. This is the town of Hay River, Northwest Territories. It is largely submerged by flood water. An evacuation order was triggered overnight for the entire town on the edge of Great Slave Lake. The territory says water levels have risen 1.7 meters over the past three days. Nearby in northern Alberta, heavy rain and snow melt have forced people from their homes. Three communities there are under local states of emergency. And in southern Manitoba, overland flood warnings and watches are in place as that saturated province braces for even more rain. Flooding isn't new, of course, but climate scientists have found Canada's north is warming more than twice as fast as regions further south, and that's having a profound impact on the environment and on people's lives. Heather Urex west has our top story tonight. Okay, it's roughly 4 o'clock in the morning, and this is Burr Crescent in Hay River. An entire community, home after home, battered by a frigid flood. You can see the water's coming up. We had a major push of ice and water and it ripped through the town and came through several areas of town that have never seen water. Uh, so we've evacuated the whole community. We heard sirens going off. There was emergency alerts going off on our phone. Marissa Oteza had little time to gather her young family together and go, opting to drive through the night to seek shelter in Yellowknife, five hours away. As we were evacuating, we could see the water rushing into the, the neighborhoods, into people's houses and yards. It was, it was kind of surreal. From the air Thursday, the devastation can be seen with heartbreaking clarity. The local airport entirely underwater. The unprecedented flooding caused by the one-two punch of a heavy snowpack melt and a river jammed with breaking ice. It's pretty tragic for the community. I mean, it, uh, it's, it's obviously a sad day, but it's also frustrating for people that aren't here. And... Uh, um, you know, they, they just want to be home, but the reality is, is ultimately we don't have the infrastructure. The town of 3500 is now assessing its water treatment plant and sewage system for damages caused by the flood. There have also been power interruptions, and there is likely to be more flooding ahead as the ice continues to crack. We have a few kilometers of ice still to deal with. Uh, so it's not really safe for most residents to return. There was a flood in 63. It wasn't uh, this bad. Areas of the Catladeche First Nation are underwater as well. In total, about 4,000 people have been displaced, with little to do now but watch and wait. Heather Urex West, Global News. Southern Manitoba is in for another downpour over the next few days, prompting that province to upgrade the flood threat in some regions. Forecasters are monitoring a system that's expected to arrive late today that could bring an additional 20 to 40 millimeters of rain. Several Manitoba communities are already dealing with major flooding. 28 of them have declared states of local emergency. Rain would be a welcome sight in California. This is the latest update from the U.S. Drought Monitor. Nearly the entire state is already under severe drought conditions. 60% of it is in extreme drought. That means there's not enough water for wildlife, agriculture, and urban needs. And all that has led to this. Overnight, a ferocious fire swept through part of Orange County, south of Los Angeles. About 20 multi-million dollar mansions in Laguna Niguel could not be saved, a foreboding sign of the new normal. The blaze broke out in brush late yesterday afternoon and fueled by powerful ocean winds, it raged across more than 80 hectares in just three hours. Officials say there's no longer a fire season, it's all year long. 
Now to Russia's war in Ukraine. Canada is boosting its military presence in Latvia, north of Ukraine. So we will be deploying a general and six staff officers to NATO's multinational division north headquarters in Adatsi. Latvia's Prime Minister was in Ottawa for meetings with Prime Minister Trudeau. The seven Canadians will be part of a first-of-its-kind unit in the northern Baltic Sea region to help plan, coordinate and integrate regional military activities. Canadian troops in Latvia are leading a battle group on NATO's eastern flank. Russia's president wants to halt NATO expansion, but his invasion of Ukraine is having the opposite effect. Today, Finland, Russia's Nordic neighbor, announced it is set to join the Western Military Alliance, and Sweden could be next. They're doing it to strengthen their own security, and almost immediately, the Kremlin warned it would retaliate. Jackson Prosko on a big shift in military alliances. With its 1,300-kilometer-long border with Russia a growing liability, Finland abandoned neutrality and set course to join NATO, blaming Vladimir Putin. My response would be that you caused this. Look at the mirror. If Finnish lawmakers approve, the country could be a full member of the alliance within a year. On the streets of Helsinki, relief. I think it's a great thing because it will bring more safety to Finland against Russian aggression. It's absolutely that we should uh, chain NATO. Sweden is expected to follow suit, throwing up a further wall against an unpredictable Russia. The Kremlin called NATO's expansion a threat and vowed to take what it called necessary measures. There is a real threat here for countries in Europe and it's going to be a threat for the long term. So I think um, Finland and Sweden are making the right choice here. Until their membership becomes official, both countries remain vulnerable, unprotected by the mutual defense of NATO's Article 5. As a stopgap, Great Britain signed security agreements vowing to protect both countries. NATO is a defensive alliance. NATO poses, NATO, uh, poses no threat uh, to anyone. If Vladimir Putin sought to break Western unity, his war in Ukraine has done the opposite. Finland and Sweden are on track to rapidly ascend to NATO, both as an insurance policy and a show of resolve against Russia. Jackson Prosko, Global News, Washington. It is day 78 of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Today, UNICEF confirmed nearly 100 children were killed in April alone, and the actual figures could be much higher. Those lucky enough to escape the fighting in Mariupol have made it to Zaporozhye. Yesterday, nearly 370 people arrived, leaving behind death, destruction, and relentless shelling. Our Europe Bureau Chief Crystal Gamansing spoke with some of them. Plotting an escape in a car nearly totaled by shelling. What, so what? This mother did everything she could think of to make her vehicle appear non-threatening to the occupying Russians. White strips of fabric on the door handles, symbols of peace, and a sign that says children written in Russian. If I stay longer, I may have lost my car. How could I leave then? So we run away. Valentina shows me a video on her phone of what used to be her apartment in Mariupol. She and her two-year-old son weren't there when it was destroyed. They've spent the past two months running basement to basement, apartment to apartment. Their last hiding place became home to about 300 people. He's too young, and I hope he will not remember those terrible events. Daniil may not, but Yuri certainly does. He says, I already lived under occupation once. It was in 1941. I no longer want to live under the occupiers again. At 94, his hearing is poor and so is his health. His daughter, Svetlana, helps us communicate with him. She says he understands what they're going through. They won't run away from a good man. Once a hotel, this building is housing 130 refugees. Yuri is the oldest. Since Russia invaded, 2,000 others have sought shelter here. It's quiet and kept dimly lit for safety. Safety and small comforts don't erase heartbreak. The pain of leaving home is immense for people here on their first day and months later. Ilana, Andriy, and their teenage daughter and his parents all escaped together. His furniture shop in Mariupol, like almost everything else, 
destroyed. We had two floors in the building and all of these loans, the loans still remain. People here say they won't go home unless they know they'll be living under a Ukrainian flag. And in the southeast, that's far from certain. Crystal Gavancing, Global News, Zaporizhia, Ukraine. Organizing a political debate with multiple candidates can be challenging, and last night's debate between six people running for the federal Tory leadership got mixed reviews. Party members have to choose one of the candidates, so did they get anything out of it? Our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, tuned in and is with us from Edmonton. David? Well, Donna, this was the first debate to feature all six candidates. Patrick Brown, the mayor of Brampton, Ontario, making his debate debut. Mr. Brown, yeah. My vision of Canada includes a Conservative Party that builds a broad, multi-faith, multicultural coalition that can win. But it's not clear Brown had much of an impact. He should have uh, gone back to selling memberships. That's what he does well. He did not look good on, on the stage. Perceived frontrunner Pierre Polyev made waves, promising to fire Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem. The Bank of Canada Governor <clears throat> has allowed himself to become the ATM machine of this government. And so I would replace him with a new governor. Economists say if Polyev was ever to make good on such a threat, and it's not clear that he could, that would actually hurt the economy. International investors get spooked. Uh, they start uh, pulling their money out of a country, in which case, you know, would put a run on the Canadian dollar, where everybody was trying to sell Canadian dollars and, and no one's buying. So, you know, that would be a bad situation. Poliev drew fire from almost all his rivals for his enthusiastic endorsement of digital cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Everyone just finds it totally bizarre what Mr. Poliev is suggesting. Anyone following his advice that we saw on YouTube would have lost 20% of their earnings. Do you actually think your parents enjoy having your parents lose 20% of their retirement funds? I mean, this is lunacy. The debate covered plenty of ground with candidates quizzed on everything from abortion to supply management to what they were binge watching on Netflix. My parliamentary colleague Eric Melillo got me hooked on Brooklyn Nine-Nine while we were doing French immersion in Quebec. It was that kind of night. The next time this group of six gets together is at the end of the month, May the 25th, in Quebec for the only French language debate. And that comes right before the June 3rd cutoff to register to vote when the race concludes in September. Donna. All right, David Aiken, thank you. The federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh calls what happened to him at a campaign stop in Peterborough, Ontario this week, one of the most intense, threatening and insulting experiences of his political career. These videos posted on social media show a small group harassing him, yelling vulgarities, calling him a liar and a traitor and saying he's not welcome. All this happened as Singh walked from an office to his vehicle. I've experienced a lot of the, this kind of hatred and, and, and being physically attacked even when I was younger and I've learned to defend myself, I've taken martial arts, but that shouldn't be the requirement that you've got to be physically fit and, and skilled in defending yourself to be a, a politician or a leader. That to me is completely wrong and problematic. Politicians of all stripes have reached out to Singh and condemned what happened, and the Peterborough Police Service says it's investigating. Writing a wrong coming up, the calls for a public inquiry into the arrest of 13 Indigenous men. Eagle feathers are sacred to many Indigenous communities, and they were at the heart of a legal case in British Columbia. Thirteen Indigenous men were charged with wildlife violations after dozens of mutilated eagle carcasses were found. Eventually, the charges were dropped, but not before the men say their reputations were damaged. And as Nithu Garcha reports, they've been demanding an apology for years. The feathers that I'm wearing are close to 100 years old. But it would be years before Chief Ralph Leon of Staelis, a First Nations tribe in BC's Lower Mainland, could wear the sacred headdress. He earned the cultural right to use it, but says a probation order barred him from using eagle feathers. Chief Leon, who survived abuse in a residential school, was arrested and strip searched when he, his friend Gary Abbott, and 11 others were charged with various Wildlife Act offenses in 2006 after nearly 50 mutilated eagle carcasses were found in North Vancouver. We had nothing to do with, with the findings of those birds. 
so they're, they're sacred to us. Almost a decade later in 2015, Crown Council determined it no longer had grounds to proceed and their charges were dropped, but not before the case claimed many of their reputations, relationships and jobs. I'm a teacher by trade and I wasn't allowed to be that teacher, which I loved so much. Nine years we went and had to check in every week for bail. Their lawyer argued the BC Conservation Officer Service used inappropriate undercover tactics attending Indigenous cultural events like powwows to gain trust, bringing alcohol onto the otherwise dry reserve and luring the accused men into illegal activity. I don't want my children or my grandchildren to have to go through that. That's why we, we were fighting this. Their story is now the subject of a petition tabled by B.C. Conservative MP Brad Viss in the House of Commons this week. Those wrongfully charged have gathered sufficient evidence showcasing A. Conspiracy to prosecute innocent people. B. Defamatory media release vilifying Indigenous peoples and cultures. C. Fabrication of evidence and concealment of evidence including perjury. When asked about a public inquiry, Justice Minister David Lametti told Global News he'll review the petition. I understand the importance of eagles and eagle feathers uh, to their, their tradition, to their ceremony, and so we'll work to try to find a solution. These men are also calling for the return of their seized regalia. Things I learned from residential school, day school, conservation services taught me something really valuable how not to be. They're also seeking an apology with acknowledgement the systemic efforts to make Indigenous culture criminal are not just a part of Canada's history, but Canada's present. Neetu Garcha, Global News, Vancouver. Managing inflation ahead, help navigating Canada's rising costs. There's no escaping sky-high inflation. It hits you everywhere, from the gas station to the grocery store. In our new series, Sticker Shock, Anne Gaviola has some ideas on navigating life's rising costs. And then we're going to swing. It was all smiles when Sandy Young welcomed little Gabriel into the world last year. But every day, there's a growing anxiety, too. Mat leave has meant bringing in less money, and the new baby also equals lots of new spending on diapers, a crib, baby food. Our family definitely has been feeling the pinch uh, with inflation and the rising costs of gas and groceries. Inflation plunged at the start of the pandemic, but it moved back beyond 2% in March 2021 and has been soaring since to levels we haven't seen in more than three decades. Ipsos polling exclusively for Global News now shows most households are cutting back on dining out. 51% are looking at flyers for bargains and nearly half are putting off new discretionary purchases like clothing. Sandy is a personal finance author that's helped her family move fast to cut back where they can and selling items they're not using for extra cash. Collecting loyalty points has also helped them pay for baby items. And the daily sticker shock she's feeling at the pumps has her ready to make the switch to an electric vehicle. We might expedite our goal because the gas prices are rising so quickly. Inflation chips away at affordability. For struggling households, it may mean some bills won't get paid right away or the debt load gets bigger. Others won't be able to save as much. So how to strategize? Well, if you can, one move may be to try boosting your income. Ask your employer for a raise. Review your budget and find ways to trim expenses. Have a look at old credit card statements. Have a look at old bank statements. What is popping up? And put your money to work. If you know you won't need it in the next little while, you can invest it in risk-insulated bonds or stocks to hedge against inflation. If you're saving for retirement, for example, 20, 30, 40 years, now is a great time to get in. Yes, it's definitely been uh, a struggle because I'm living on 70% of my normal income. We uh, review our monthly budget together um, to ensure that we um, are cash flow positive uh, month to month. This new economic reality may lead to better financial habits to last a lifetime. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Next, the first images of the mystery at the centre of our galaxy. There is still so much we don't know about the universe, but now we have at least a glimpse at what lies at the heart of our galaxy, the Milky Way. 
And as Mike Drolet explains, the effort it took to get the image is out of this world. This wasn't just any picture. For astronomers, it's the picture. The first direct image of the gentle giant in the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star. To put the discovery in context, it was announced in seven countries simultaneously. This is the first image. So this is what they unveiled. And while we can't actually see a black hole, we can see the glowing gas around it. And given time and more pictures, they'll be able to analyze how it's evolving. No! Which Star Wars apparently didn't get right. A bit of poetic license, shall we say. The massive Milky Way galaxy has over 100 billion stars, one of which is our sun. So seeing into the middle of it all has proven to be difficult. Still, scientists have long believed if they could, they'd find a black hole. For me personally, I met it 20 years ago and have loved it and tried to understand it since. But until now, we didn't have the direct picture confirming that Sajay star was indeed a black hole. They took the picture using the Event Horizon Telescope, which is actually 11 telescopes scattered around the world. And when synced up, they create a virtual telescope dish as large as the Earth itself. To say it's complicated would be underselling it. You've got to look through the plane of our galaxy. And there's an awful lot of stuff between us and the center of the galaxy. Stars, dust, gas, planets, you name it, it's there. And to be able to tease out the details of the supermassive black hole, you have to get rid of literally everything in the pathway. And that's why the observation, uh, the observational analysis took the better part of three years. Three years to get one image, but considering it's at the heart of the galaxy, well worth the wait. Mike Drillet, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is this nighttime view of Calgary. Thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.